So we have uh, Alessandros joining us from the city of Lecce. Giacomo Baraghi is, is here wearing many hats, one of which uh, I'm surprised they actually let him loose. He's, he's doing PR for the Expo 2015 in Milan. So I, I don't know how many favors you had to cash in to, to take some time off after only, I, I think, what, a month now that the, the Expo has been up and running? Nice to meet you as well. Thank you very much. Our, our final, you're our anchor panel, so we'll, um, we'll wrap up the day, uh, I think, carrying on um, with a few points. I, I do want to speak a little bit about citizen engagement. Karen, you, you brought that up in one of your last points, and I, I think that there's the, the idea of how we engage with our data itself, but more importantly, how do we engage with our, our citizens? So I, I did want to raise that, but I'll, I'll first maybe um, Alessandro, turn over and let you introduce yourself and, and just give us a little bit of context of, of how you're working in, in the city and the smart city uh, world in, in Lecce. Hi, uh, thank you for the invitation. My name is Alessandro Linoci. Uh, I am a city councillor of uh, the city of Lecce. Uh, uh, my, uh, my activity is uh, in uh, young politics, uh, European politics, uh, and innovation. Uh, I am uh, 32 years old. I start my, uh, my activity politics three years uh, ago. And uh, uh, I developed a, a different city. I want to uh, speak about uh, social innovation city. It's a little different because uh, it's a, a different vision uh, that start uh, after uh, the the opportunity uh, that uh, Lecce lost of uh, European capital of culture. Now this year we are uh, a Italian capital of culture, and uh, we continue this uh, activity with uh, to involve the people because. Uh, um, Lecce is uh, in the uh, southeast of uh, Italy, and uh, there isn't uh, more uh, industry, more firm. So we start the activity uh, to uh, uh, involve the people to uh, uh, start uh, uh, the, uh, the valorization of the monument. So. Uh, we think that the culture is uh, the real business of the city, so not only the culture of the monuments, but the culture of the people. So we, are, we want uh, and we start to create a, a big community, the community that uh, start uh, uh, to uh, uh, the collaboration with the, the University of the Center of Research, and uh, we have now uh, a community with uh, uh, 100 uh, startups, uh, but not only this, uh, we involve uh, uh, more of than uh, departments uh, of innovation, engineering, uh, and uh, uh, all of uh, the center of research start uh, a, a a laboratory in the center, and uh, we, it is a sure opportunity uh, to uh, involve uh, a big uh, industry and firm uh, to, uh, for our city. Thank you. I'm, I'm really happy that Alessandro's joined us. I don't think we can talk about smart cities in the future and, and not talk about youth and youth engagement, so I think that will be um, a, a, good, a good conversation for us moving forward. Uh, but uh, this is important that uh, all the smart city projects must to involve the young people. If you don't involve the uh, young people, uh, it's very difficult to create the community. The young people is uh, in the center to develop a smart and community city. And I want to be clear that we include people in their 40s and, and young people. It's part of the age bracket, just for those who may be in their 40s in the room. 
Um, Giacomo, do you want to just, uh, I, I think we've had some questions about agriculture, uh, both this morning and this afternoon, and I know that's a theme um, this year of, of Expo 2015. And, and looking, I, I was curious from your perspective, having been there for a month, and, and while this is at a country level, if, if you're starting to see anything in the pavilions that, that might start to take us into that future glimpse of where countries are focusing when it, when it comes to um, their nations, but also cities moving forward, and is, are we getting back to those, the basics of, of food, energy, and, and all those, those elements that are important? Yeah, uh, I asked myself, where do we go from here in 2030? And I think that Expo, it's really, a showcase of this, and I um, briefly uh, share with you three lessons learned from this event, from these 45 days, and I assume that there are also three trends for the future that we can uh, analyze from Expo. The three lessons learned are a sort of case study of what will happen in the future to me, of cities also. One, it's um, Ask Expo, it's a Twitter account, but not only a Twitter account, it's a um, gift that Twitter from US wanted to uh, give us to Expo, and it's the first time ever that uh, they create a sort of um, municipality, uh, city, uh, real-time information account. They will try it here in Expo, and then they will move to New York, and other cities. So the first lesson learned is that maybe cities are not only their government, and Expo is not only us, but some private could arrive and uh, do CRM uh, better than us. Then there are another lesson learned, it's called E015. It's the first open service platform in the world. We create a sort of standard, and all the relevant players like uh, Società Autostrade, Trenitalia, um, all the um, Alitalia, and others, uh, transport or uh, service um, player, they share their open services live, free to any player that would like to integrate these in their own business. For example, Epson, they um, took this uh, service from uh, um, the real-time information that all those players gave for free, and uh, they integrated in any um, uh, proof of payment uh, in Milan. So when you buy a coffee in a cafeteria, um, they show you uh, the delays in trains, in metro, all the relevant events in within one kilometer from the cafe. So, for example, that's a, a very interesting use. And uh, um, the second lesson learned is that maybe free open services will be soon uh, um, a commodity. And third lesson learned is Expo in Città. It's the first crowdsourced platform from events. Uh, more than 40,000 events uh, gathered together, uh, bottom up, uh, creating a sort of uh, Fuori Expo, uh, like the Fuori Salone, uh, but not uh, controlled by the city government, but uh, spontaneously gathered through this platform. Those are three lessons learned that is happening now in Expo. And then I can see from these first months three trends, very strong to me. First is that offline is maybe the new black. So uh, Expo is a sort of Facebook offline. It was invented in 1851 as an horizontal peer-to-peer -peer meeting physically. And uh, uh, the incredible success of this event, even in the digital age, show us that maybe the role of technology is really declining as the center of uh, our uh, need and the new luxury is offline. Second big trend in the 2030, I'm thinking about 2030 from Expo, it's the temporary autonomous zones rocks. Temporary autonomous zones is an um, invention from a poet called John Law, then he invented this Burning Man festival, very well known, and Expo is a temporary autonomous zone. It's a sort of startup city, 
to um, call another very famous uh, uh, expression from Zachary uh, Caceres. Uh, he invented this special governance zone where um, individual creativity is the real uh, energy, where pirates, in a way, rocks. And um, you see in Expo uh, this collective uh, anarchy in action. And third uh, trend, mega trend in 2030 from Expo, is that international relations are not a state monopoly or privilege anymore because um, Milan or uh, city or uh, individual players, uh, uh, companies, NGOs, civil society association, more than 412 different actors, they are autonomously uh, doing their own business together uh, without any central uh, driven state uh, uh, monopoly. So those are the three lessons learned and the three trends. So I think that um, maybe Benjamin Barber were uh, right. Maybe major will rule the world in the future. Maybe we should stop to speak about individual smart cities by starting to imagine um, a network uh, in a new urban age where interconnected, powerful, influential cities, they are like place of inspiration, place for experiment, place for individual creativity and interest meet together, place for serendipity, not only for strategy. Maybe uh, now in the future, in the 2030, Expo is showing us that state will be again in cities. Maybe it's urban age again. Great. We're already, we're already in 2030 and I'm loving it. Um, I, you gave me some really good points to feed off of uh, around when we talked about maybe cities aren't, aren't only their government. I, I think that's really important for us to remember. And, and looking at, uh, you talked about crowdsourced platforms. And I, I just wanted to go back to citizen engagement a bit. And, and Jennifer, you touched on these entrepreneurs who are, who are saying we have a solution and we, can, we have a problem, we can actually now build our own solutions and, and not have to wait for our tax dollars to maybe address it or maybe not. And I, I was just speaking with, with Jennifer quickly at lunch about a project out of Paris and, and it's called Madam Mayor, uh, I Have an Idea. And <laughs> are people familiar with this? No. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's really fascinating. Um, what the mayor is doing, and it's not unlike some of the technologies like idea scale uh, or others where, where it's citizen generated ideas that you vote on, but, but what the mayor has committed to is allocating 500 million euros to projects, that's a tremendous amount of money for people who are looking at city budgets, um, or any budget quite frankly, uh, looking to allocate that money to projects by citizens between the years 2014 and 2020. And the most pro popular proposals so far, with more than 21,000 votes, uh, are looking at developing 41 vertical garden projects in the cities. So, so what I find interesting about this, I, I was talking to a friend the other day about it, and she said, well, that's only 21,000 votes. But what they're doing is they're at least engaging citizens through different means and, and saying that for people who want to take the time to submit ideas and, and for other people to vote on them, I think it ended up being 5% of the, that fiscal year budget would be allocated to the most popular project. So, I mean, it is democratic. It's also a way of, of allowing people to, to say there is an opportunity for, for you to have a vote. So there's, there's no denying now that technology is creeping into how we engage and, and how we look at things and that there are civic actors who sometimes are better city ambassadors than the mayor or some of the city councillors. That, that you have people who are activists, whether it's in the biking community um, or we look at community gardens and they, they just start having a really strong voice. And, and that is, I think, threatening to city officials in, in a lot of respects. Um, and, and we even deal with it at the federal level of, of employees now having stronger voices of credibility really on, on certain issues. But how do we now reconcile this crowdsourcing ability or the fact that three 20 year olds are, are sitting there wondering why there's a problem and they're gonna build an app to fix it and it's really got nothing to do with the city. Karen, you, you were mentioning last night that someone in Guelph was making phenomenal videos about Guelph. They don't work for the city, but they're doing a phenomenal job of branding Guelph and it's likely a better product than what bureaucrats yeah. would, would put out because bureaucrats aren't known for being creative and 
We aren't given the power, or it would take us 15 levels of approval to get a 30 minute, uh, 30 second yes. video produced. <laughs> so I just wanted to ask your, your thoughts about that. We talk about technology being disruptive, and I think it's now starting to creep into our, our public administration of that tension, Jennifer, you, you spoke about between just civilians taking matters into their own hand and really pressuring government to, to deliver and it might not be what you had in your budget for the year. Um, and do we start to adjust things according, and, and how do we not be just responsive, because they're nasty people on Twitter, saying, why aren't you doing this, but that we engage in a way that, that responds to how they want to engage with us, and, and we keep track of what they're doing, and, and maybe find ways to, to use some of these products or citizens to help advance multiple priorities and maybe our tourism budget, budget drops 50% because these people are, are taking care of it for us. So really an open question, but I, I think that there is going to be um, some, there are going to be challenges for cities in, in looking at this civic engagement, whether they want it or not scenario. Karen, would you like to kick off? So the, one of the questions that interests me to, in, in all of this is, um, so the city, um, uh, has a, an issue to address, um, let, let's say something even simple. We've got a new park, um, we have an engagement program around what's gonna happen in that new park. Uh, we use lots of technologies, we get a lot of input and, and are able to sift through it and, we, and a master plan is developed for that park. Um, it, it's within the budget, there's been a budget set, goes to council. What role is there for elected officials other than to just agree? Um, and not start, well, we don't want, the, we don't think a basketball court is needed here. Or we want, I want to see this in this park. What, what role is there? And, and we, we're hitting, you know, the city's been hitting those issues. And there is no role if you've done a, a, a designed a, a process like that and you've had that input. So it really is going to challenge traditional roles. Um, so to challenge the traditional roles of elected officials, challenge the traditional roles of, of uh, the administration, um, like the tourism example, and those are going to be very um, challenging conversations to have. And we will really have to understand the governance, the new governance that goes around that, um, and in, particularly in terms around sustainability of how do you sustain some of these um, initiatives that are out in the community and ensure that that's there. So I think it's going to be a very interesting time. Um, I think there's going to be a renaissance of local government, um, and I think I agree. It won't, uh, cities won't be just about the local government. The local government will provide very important platforms for convening people for championing issues that the community thinks is important for being a facilitator, but our understanding of a city will be much broader than that. Um, and I agree, I think the work that John is doing, I think in terms of those networks of cities, um, it, it, the, its sub-national actors globally will play a much stronger role in um, solving and addressing global issues. John? So um, I'd like to just say that cities are actually crucibles for the transformation of, uh, of uh, you know, how cities evolve, how people evolve, um, how processes evolve. So I agree, it's not just about uh, municipalities and, and so forth, it's about people in those communities and how we service them, but also how the private sector and uh, our educational institutions provide for them. Uh, let, me, let me give you a plug for the Canadian uh, uh, government. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think cities need to better understand, and the people in those cities better understand, is how to break down barriers. And one of those barriers is available right now uh, to break down. Uh, you have a CETA agreement, the Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement. Did somebody's uh, bucket get... Uh pressed at that moment. Uh, here's, here's an agreement that breaks down tariffs, uh, provides opportunities for citizens uh, from many countries to be able to move into Canada and take advantage of, um, of the benefits of that agreement, and yet nobody knows about it. Uh, everybody I talk to in the, in the, in, in the, in the uh, yard here uh, were astonished about that opportunity. 
Uh, I've traveled for the last year talking about this. Uh, throughout Europe, Europeans don't know about it. They, and in fact, when, when others start to talk about it, they talk about the American one. Well, there is no American one. They're maybe thinking about it, but this is a first mover advantage. So my point is, is that information, uh, data, information, opportunities in a community need to be advanced in very strategic ways. And from an economic development point of view, uh, there are lots of people who just aren't being given the right information at the right time uh, when they need it to be able to succeed. And I'm not exactly sure how that's going to transform a city. I do know that in a community like Toronto or other city, information is easily available, but it's lost in the, in the morass of all those people. Some of the smaller communities get it a lot faster. So you in fact have a rural, regional, and urban issue here. And then you have the demographics of millennials versus others who they have absolutely no either idea or interest in it. Uh, but, but it's going to be very important for them. So how do we look at this as an ecosystem and as a spectrum of uh, information exchange and as a way of targeting who needs to know what in order to be able to succeed? And that is, I think, a, a key issue in the future. Aren't we supposed to have the answers here, John? 2030? <laughs> Well, I'm raising this as a, as a question. These are things, I mean, when you, when you look at an expo, uh, you go there, and what do you go there for? Uh, to exchange ideas, to be inspired. Uh, these things happen pretty irregularly, but, you know, uh, they can happen every day now. We have the technology to be able to do that in our communities. Uh, they can be virtual. They can also be part of the excitement of what happens in a community. There's a community of interest, uh, there's a group called um, Communitech in Waterloo that constantly bring and merge people together for that excitement. They have peer-to-peer -peer meetings and mashups and whatnot. So for a specific uh, community of interest, uh, they get it. Uh, another one in Toronto, Mars, where they're constantly feeding this information to who, those people who want it. But you have to be wanting to participate. So there's an attitudinal thing as part of this as well. Alice um, The millennials came up and, and when we look at engagement, I, I think that I, I would like to just hear your thoughts on that under 30. And, and moving forward, the, the success, I think creativity, uh, inspiration are words when you look at the startup communities or, or that entrepreneur um, spirit that, that's living. How do you see the need for, or how do you see cities needing to adjust to, to make sure that the under 30s, or even quite frankly the under 20s, start to engage with their cities? I think anyone who's 14 right now is going to be voting um, in the next two, four, six years, depending on, on where they live. And, and I think that we, we tend to actually overshoot by 10 years when we look at who the important people are. How do we start to engage people in their teens and early 20s to make sure that they're a part of our city, our democracy, uh, decision making, and hopefully even part of cities moving forward and, and contribute to that. I think it's uh, more simple uh, the engagement when uh, uh, you have uh, a big arguments, similar to European capital of culture. But uh, it's uh, very difficult when uh, you go to the interest uh, of the uh, the films or, or a, a single uh, a economic development uh, of the people so but i want uh, to tell you a, a simple example a simple example is uh, uh, our activity in uh, open data. Our city event uh, not more money, but uh, have uh, many data. So we start to uh, teach to not only to uh, engineering, uh, to informatics, 
uh, what is open data. Well, I start uh, to explain open data to engineering architects and uh, simple enterprise or single people. So they ask to, uh, to us what uh, kind of uh, data that want. And uh, with uh, a little money, we start uh, a contest open data and we start uh, a new service with uh, this contest and we start a new engagement uh, to do a, a new service and now we have uh, more uh, than websites that tell uh, the city and more than uh, application and we start uh, the simple uh, Apple Store of Ledge. This is a, a kind of engagement to, uh, to do open data and to do a new opportunity for the, the young people and the startup. But uh, uh, it's important to involve that data. It's very important not only who want to develop uh, a applica a application for a smartphone, but uh, it's very important uh, for uh, a, a normal uh, professionist or normal uh, people. Great. Just, uh, just one question on that, and then we're going to gaze into the future. You already took us there, and we're going to return, Giacomo. Um, when we look at youth engagement in particular, should we assume it's all going to be technology driven? Um, is, is that simply the way cities need to go? Karen, I, I really was interested in your comments about your, your bus tours and, and when we look at uh, Jennifer Toronto's 49% uh, population wasn't born in Canada and we're, we're welcoming people from other cities, so can we assume that the common thread will be technology or, or were we now forced to, to look at different ways of engaging depending on uh, cultures, age groups? where they live in the city and, and how they choose to live, urban uh, versus the, the rural, rural communities or even suburban. Just, just wanted your thoughts and, and I know experience on, on what you've done and, and saying that we, we have to mix it up and, and is there a magic formula? Uh, is that formula going to change moving forward or, or is it something that we, we have to have a pretty diverse recipe to, to do that? Karen? So far, I, th I mean, I think it's a diverse recipe. Uh, I, it, it, we can attract um, people to traditional ways of engaging as well as new ways of engaging. So, um, at the moment, uh, what that does do, what that does, is just broaden the voices that come into uh, into the conversation. So. I think it's always, it's, it's constantly practicing and, and testing and evaluating and adjusting. Um, and so it is, it will be adaptive as it, as it goes along. And um, some technologies might come and go in terms of being useful at one point and as a useful platform to gather um, input and, 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 but then become less so. So I think it's more about being adaptable and, 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 extracting the data out of it to evaluate the actual process as well. Um, and uh, so the, the review of the process needs to be ongoing as well. Are we, are we agile enough for that right now? Are, are cities equipped to, to not take five years to, to adjust or, or adapt? I know that, I, I think it's challenging for, for cities. A city of our size, our technology platforms are weak. Um, when you're in a budget conversation and there's limited resources, it's hard to get the community excited about investing in your technology platforms. Um, and as a consequence, and I'm sure Guelph is, an, uh, is not unlike a lot of municipalities, um, they're not where they need to be to be able to, to step up to the aspirations of the community with respect to the digital age. So we, um, a couple of years ago, understood we needed to make a big investment, and so we developed our technology strategy in a multi-year um, investment strategy 
to lift, but we did it in parallel to doing the open government um, strategy. So two things, we could be strategic in the investments we made and made sure that they um, were lined up with the um, uh, highest benefit for the community because they were feeding in what they wanted to see and be able to experience. So we needed to build those platforms for them. Um, and at the same time, we built support for the technology investments because people could see the link to their experience of their local government and the performance of their local government and, and engagement with their local government. Um, I think the interesting thing, it's a little bit of an aside, over the last 20 years, um, as our capacity to engage has gone up, engagement has dropped. And so the, so the gap has gotten bigger. And so um, what will be interesting to me is, is we have, the success of this is, is um, participation of people in the process. Um, so the real unknown to me is, will we be able to actually close that gap and, and bring people back? Um, and part of that we've identified strategically is um, we need to play a role in civic education. Um, we can't just hope and assume that that will happen outside. Um, and, and that will in it itself will be an engagement with the community on how we do that. And, and maybe at some point, it won't be us that delivers it, maybe it will come out of the community, but we know we need to um, be a champion and a catalyst for that. Um, because the gap of understanding of the, of the citizens of the local government is a real barrier for moving forward on a number of initiatives. So um, it'll be interesting to see whether we can close that gap. Well, I would like to just pick up on that. The, uh, the previous Alessandro um, talked about um, city building as, uh, uh, or the work that we do at the municipal level as being a collective shared project, that it's something that we do, we do collectively. And if it's something that we do collectively, one of our most critical tasks is building a shared consensus because the extent to which we have a shared consensus, things will proceed and things will advance. And the extent to which we don't, we'll get, we'll get stuck, we'll get trapped. And I see the opportunity of open data and technologies as being a tool to facilitate building that shared consensus. Now, we do know that different demographics, to your point about young people, uh, different demographics like to participate in building that shared consensus in different ways. So we, for example, ran a uh, process related to our official plan review called Feeling Congested, uh, whereby this is around our transportation policies. Uh, we're consulting on complete streets and our cycling infrastructure and our transit infrastructure. So we went out on subways, we went out on buses, we went into public spaces. We also created a web-based platform. We also ha held uh, workshops in the community and public open houses and thousands and thousands of people participated and we got lots of good input and information. When that process was done, we did an Ipsos Read poll to evaluate our success in that process and we found some shocking results. And the shocking result was that despite the fact that thousands and thousands of people had participated in this process, we had over 7,000 people participating just on the online component, that overwhelmingly the participants were homeowners. Now, in the city of Toronto, about 50% of the population are tenants, they're renters. But the vast majority of our participants were people who owned property. Our participants were also vastly over 55 in age. Now, the fastest growing demographic in the city is under 35. And then thirdly, we discovered that the vast majority of the participants were white. And of course, nearly 50% of the population in the city is non-white. So we have over 55 white homeowners that are primarily participating. Now, if you look at the numbers of people participating, it looks fabulous. But the reality is it isn't even remotely representative of the residents of the city of Toronto. So we've engaged in a youth engagement strategy and we've been developing a youth engagement strategy. We've gone out with uh, a youth research team into various communities across the city to understand what do we need to do to shift and engage uh, young people in a more significant way. And not surprisingly, what we learned was that technology really matters. 
using multimedia, videos, platforms on the web, uh, Twitter is important, but other forms, uh, Instagram, other forms of technology are really important. They're an important point of contact. They're not the consultation in and of itself. They don't necessarily, necessarily build consensus, but they are points of contact to draw people into a more substantive process. So the workshops, the conversations, the meeting is where the real work gets done, where the real consensus building takes place, but the technology is a tool to draw people who wouldn't necessarily participate into the process into the process in new ways. So that was a really important, uh, important learning for us. You know, I believe that um, Twitter is a really great example of a, of a disruptive technology for democracy because here you have on Twitter, you now have residents, we're a city of 2.8 million people, you know, it's a very large city. There's 44 city councillors, but a resident can send a tweet to a city councillor or can send a tweet to the chief planner and, you know, I'm not always going to respond, but I make a point of responding, I make a point of responding at times uh, so that people can have direct interaction with me, which is, it's pretty tough to get a meeting with me, but you can ask me a question on Twitter and I can send you back information and I can interact with you. And that also acts as a really important touchstone for me. I see the reaction of the community on Twitter and it actually helps shape me, our city planning priorities, because I say, wow, there's a real movement around this idea or that idea in the community. Uh, it's not everything, but it's a slice. It's a slice of what's happening within our city. It's one input into understanding some of the temperature and reading the temperature in the city. So I think it's really critical to recognize that these technologies that allow for a much more direct form of interaction than has ever existed before are a very powerful way of democratizing our, uh, our processes in our city and allowing people to engage in complex processes that otherwise, you know, how do I get to a committee and make a deputation? Like, who knows how to do that? That's complicated stuff. There's a very small percentage of the population who's going to figure that out. But there's a much greater part of the population who's going to say, hey, I can send a tweet to my councillor or, uh, or, or to Parks and Rec or to another part of the administration and get a response. So I think in that way it's very disruptive from the systems that we've had in the past that have been very closed and it is a form of opening up access to government. That's a, that's a great point. Um, I know our ambassador is, is big on the open government. I've, there are many definitions. Uh, I've always had interpretations of open access to people mm. and, and be able to reach out to those people and, and I have been one of those who's poked Jennifer. She didn't know me before coming to Rome but she might look back in her Twitter feed and see me, but, but it is really an opportunity to not send an anonymous email through a city of account and, and actually go to the people that you know uh, should be informed or might have the information you need, so I, I think that connection is, is a bit of a shift and it's, I respond to the cities, I think the mayor in Calgary back in, in Canada is another example of one of the leading mayors who uses social media to, I think he spends an hour twice a week retweeting lost pets for his community. Um, and everyone laughs at that, but you know, it's, it's done a lot to open him up to, and be in touch with his citizens and humanize the, the role of office a bit. I, I think those are really good points about digital platforms, especially being a hook to deeper engagement. And, and I, I think it's really important we remember for cities, it is about the people. And, and we don't want everything just to be a, a, a tweet away. It's what's the engagement beyond that. I, I want to, I think we're getting close to wrap up time, so I, I don't have a crystal ball, but we've got a lot of faux crystal bottles on the, the table, so we'll use those. And, and I certainly encourage participation from the room if people have thoughts, fears, or concerns about 2030 or 2031 in Toronto's case. Um, <laughs> Giacomo sort of set the tone with the, the expo, and I think expos have always been that future looking yep. opportunity for us to, to see countries of the future, cities of the future. And, and, and try to explore um, where are we going to be in 15 years. If you have kids at home, um, when they graduate high school, what, what's it going to look like? Are they going to be graduating high school in the same way? We talked earlier about different education. Um, so I'll really just open it up to, to all of you on where do you want cities to be, um, especially you know Jennifer and Karen, people who have 
been at the forefront of a city and guiding it and having a vision. Where would you like to sit back in 15 years and see your cities? Uh, where do you fear we might not get? Uh, or might, what might prevent us from getting there? And, and what are the challenges that, that face cities? But, but I'd really just leave it up to you for your comments on 2030, 2031, um, Toronto's going to be here, or, or we hope that smaller cities will be there and, and let's, let's sort of do some visioning and then we'll said to Jessica, we'll have to find a way to collect all these ideas in a smart city time capsule and we'll open it up in 2030 and see how our predictions turned out. Um, John, maybe I'll, I'll start with you and, and get your initial thoughts. So I think uh, the, where it's really important is to uh, figure out a way to create a balance of uh, fiscal spending around uh, not only improved infrastructure, because a lot of cities are falling apart and need to be uh, properly maintained, and the cost of maintenance is very important, uh, and also the new infrastructure that moves it forward in, into the future, from transportation to uh, the high-speed broadband we talked about earlier and, and so forth. Uh, but uh, you need to also balance that with uh, proper education and the new ways to educate. Uh, obviously, um, uh, you know, entrepreneurialism is a key ingredient to the future of jobs. And uh, in some cases, and we look at third world cities as well, uh, it's also a leveler. It's bringing able to bring people out of societies that were very um, uh, difficult to deal with into situations where people can can actually be educated and be part of, of, uh, of a society that's uh, very beneficial. Uh, the concepts of education require not only uh, the K-12, to but the university and, and, and engaging a research institute uh, as part of communities. Uh, you need to have the opportunities to be able to explore beyond just the average and uh, many cities that are now looking to be these kinds of smart communities, intelligent communities, are engaging those research institutes, those research universities, to be able to bring them into the future. And I think if you're just sitting back and letting other communities do it, I think that, uh, that won't help. Uh, we've talked about youth engagement, and I think the future of the next level of millennials uh, is very important because uh, understanding where they fit in in the future and how to resolve some of the issues that that they will they will bring in into the uh, the discourse is very important. I'll just give you an example. Uh, in Stuttgart, a new app was developed called Movell, and Movell is really about uh, movement and movement that millennials would like to engage in. They don't necessarily need a car. In fact, they'll want a car. They'd rather have uh, access to a really good smartphone. Uh, they want to have high-speed broadband. And so movement can sometimes be uh, the movement of the mind as opposed to the movement of the flesh. Uh, the other parts of it is is that they don't necessarily even want to own anything like that. Uh, if they can use a bike and pick it up and drop it off somewhere else, uh, that would be terrific. And in some cases, they just need to know that when they want to move from A to B, what is the best way of that movement? It doesn't have to be transport, it could be feet. But they need to understand that there are all these obstacles. You know, the, the subway could be down, uh, the buses are clogged, the cars are clogged down the streets. Uh, maybe there's a pathway through a plus 15 system uh, or underground system that takes them there faster. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that we need to look for in, um, in creating some of these new opportunities as we move forward. Thanks, John. Karen? So I think um, looking at uh, cities in Canada, and particularly Ontario, um, we're getting our downtowns right, um, and that seems to be moving um, very strongly. So I think, you know, in, in you were looking in the 2030 period, I think we're, we'll just see more emergence of very strong downtowns in, in smaller and smaller cities. It's a, a change that happened in larger cities, but is happening at the smaller, mid-sized city level as well. So I think we'll see more of that. I think we will get better, better at the new parts of our city and that we will um, successfully start bringing a more integrated approach to how we build new 
parts of our community. So I, I think during that period, it's going to be the bits in between. Um, and, you know, they'll be looking at what the, the downtowns have, they'll look at what these new integrated neighborhoods have, and they're going to be wanting it. Um, and so I think we're going to be really challenged by the parts of our city that have, uh, have been built over the last 50 years um, and have an, an embedded infrastructure, which is didn't get it right the first time, and so now what do you do? So I think the challenge will be in, in that part and, and a, a demand from those neighborhoods to have what they're seeing elsewhere in the city. Thanks, Karen. Jennifer? Well, I think um, if we get it right, we will in fact um, focus continually more and more in our planning um, of our cities on creating places for people. and. Our technology will be a tool to assist that. Um, this idea that uh, the new the new black is in fact uh, no Wi-Fi is a very powerful idea. Uh, in the context of a competition, a design competition that we ran in Toronto for people under the age of 30, called the Next City Design, we asked people to design a public space, and you had to be under 30 years old. It was about young people redesigning their city. And what was so fascinating was the number of proposals that came forward that had a Wi-Fi free zones as being a critical part of creating livable cities and connected spaces. So the notion that uh, disconnecting is now the best way to connect. So I think the more connected we've become, uh, electronically, the more desire there is now to have again, once again, face-to-face -face interaction. So that brings us back to designing cities as places for people, and uh, it's great in this city to talk about the importance of uh, public squares and the forum, the notion that our, our cities and our neighborhoods need to center on pedestrian public spaces where our day-to-day -day lives entwine and interact. And I really believe that's a critical part of creating livable cities. It's a critical part of safe cities. It's a critical part of creating cities where children are free to roam because it's safe for children to roam, to walk around, to walk to school, to be a part of public space. And we've gone through an era where we've sort of forgotten about children, we've designed around cars, uh, we've increasingly taken children out of public space and said public space isn't safe for you. And I think the extent to which we begin designing spaces for children and places for children to be safe where people know they're not neighbors, where there's a sense of community, the extent to which we do that, we will create truly livable cities. No matter how big they are, they'll be truly livable. And the risk, of course, is that our cities get bigger and bigger and bigger and we become less and less connected. And I think that's a profound risk and a profound opportunity moving forward. You're going to have to find something to disagree with, John. It's great. Alessandro. So, <clears throat> it's sure that uh, Lecce is, uh, will be, uh, will have uh, more infrastructure, more uh, ultra large uh, broadband, but uh, more uh, application with smartphone. But uh, for me, <clears throat> it's uh, not more important. It's important. Um, this uh, there isn't uh, an individual policy because uh, the individual policy, uh, I think, that uh, replaces to person policy. It's uh, a, a very important because, uh, uh, as uh, you say, the relationship uh, between the people and the participation uh, of the people. And uh, um, uh, if uh, more person uh, think the city with uh, the community, they start uh, to collaborate, uh, to, to start a new policy of collaboration, participation, and uh, develop the new city. I don't know where is the city in uh, 2030, but uh, I am sure there is a, a new community and not only the individual city. Thank you. Yep. So 2030 will be to me a near of oxymor. 
uh, because at the same time city will evaporate quickly as a public single bureaucratic body, but at the same time city will become again quickly more powerful and important in terms of problem solver and uh, uh, player in the international um, role and international relations. So I think that city in 2030 will become at the same time powerful and influential at the global scale, liquid, open, and transparent at the local scale. So from smart city to pilot city, powerful, influential, liquid, open, and transparent, leading the next urban age. From smart city to pilot city. Pilot Piloting city. <laughs> the new urban age. That's great. Uh, any comments from the room of, of dreams? You have some people here who could possibly help shape them, so take advantage. I'm, I'm certainly going to take advantage of being able to speak to a Canadian city planner after and share my own vision for 2030. 31. 31. <laughs> any thoughts? Well, thank you very much to... to oh, sorry. To, well, the microphone? Great, thank you. Just one comment. These are my personal ideas. So my impression is that we <coughs> will grow in communication enormously. Then we are going to, at least in Italy, I, I don't know in Canada, it's going to be different. We are going to lose the jobs because we are optimizing all this. So that means that in 30 years, everyone is just working a few hours a day, get a salary. And there's a lot of free time. And so I think that city will be the playground for adults. So I think there should be an evolution in that direction. Final comments? Well, I'll just say that I remember when I was in grade five, maybe, when I was a kid, we were told how there would yes. Yeah, there would be no work in the future, that everything would be done by computers. And uh, our biggest problem would be we would have so much leisure time. Uh, and um, that's not actually quite how things have turned out. So I'm reticent to predict what employment looks like in the future. Um, but I do know that uh, we do know that we have some profound, complex challenges to solve. Climate change is changing everything we do. It will change the way we eat, the way we move, the way we design infrastructure, and it will involve and require a tremendous amount of knowledge and talent to solve those challenges. So uh, I agree with the comments that John made earlier about the importance of a knowledge-based economy, and I do believe that we will see work increasingly being knowledge-based, um, but at the same time, we, will, we will continue to have very simple, pragmatic challenges. Clean water, access to electri electricity, affordable housing. Um, I, I don't see a panacea for the future for any of those challenges. We, are, we have a mayor right now who is very passionate about affordable housing, and we have a series of different initiatives that we have underway right now. And what's very clear is that it will take complex solutions, a variety of different solutions. There's no one answer to solve these problems. And it will involve a lot of people to get the job done. So I'm pretty confident there's always going to be, as long as there's humanity, as long as the world is changing around us, there is going to be a tremendous amount of work to do. Uh, some people might be fortunate or unfortunate, depending on your worldview, to opt out of that. But I think most of us are going to have to show up to participate in creating the future that we want to see. Yeah. I think that's, um, that's a fun, fantastic point to, to end on and, and very well captures, I think, a lot of our discussion this afternoon. So again, my thanks to all of you. My thanks to the other panelists who joined us this afternoon. Um, I, I'm just looking at the, the tweets that have been going out and I don't envy our colleagues at the embassy who have to try to capture this and what we're encouraging from our bureaucrats to be three pages or less. <laughs> <laughs>